Hello, it's Julie again, and I have a really special guest with me today. As you all know, it's my great friend, Franka Java Petter. Um, he has written many, many books, but his whole life really um, changed when he went to visit and stay with Osho in India. And he has finally, finally written his book about his time living with Osho. And you can see behind him the cover of the book. And so we're here today to, <laughs> to talk about this wonderful new book. I have read it. It's absolutely fabulous. And I'm, of course, very fortunate because I know Ajaba extremely well. Uh, we spend lots of time together over the years, and I've heard many of the stories, but I know how it affected his life and how he brings the beautiful teachings of Osho into all he does and really lives the spirit. So over to you, Mr. Ajava. How are you? Thank you, Julie. It's always such a pleasure being with you. We don't spend enough time together in person, but I hope that will change in the future. Me too. But, okay, this is better than not meeting at all. And this way we have the chance to meet all of you who are watching this video yes. as well. So uh, let me tell you how this story came to be, or this book, how this book was born or the idea of this book was born it was about um, 10 years ago or so I had pneumonia and some of my friends were really worried about me that I would um, leave this planet uh, kind of prematurely so some of my friends said to me please write down all the things you know about Reiki all the things that happened in between in between the lines, you know, things that you don't talk about in public and all the political stuff and all this, because you're the only one who knows it and uh, it would all get, would be lost if you didn't do it. So I had lots of time. I had about three weeks I had to spend in bed. My doctor was telling me, if you don't go to bed, I'm putting you in the hospital. So I said, okay. I'm going to bed and I started to write about my all my Reiki research, all the things that I hadn't mentioned in, in the books. And then when I got to the end of it, I thought, wow, people always ask me, how was your time with Osho? How was that? What was it like? What did you pass through in that time? How did that mold you into the person that you are? Now, and I thought, okay, I have more time. So I started to write that. And then in the end, I wrote my childhood about my childhood and everything that ever happened to me. So it became a, like a 500 page uh, story, <laughs> <laughs> which afterwards, when I got better, I didn't really want to publish. I, I just thought it's actually going to be nice for my wife and for my kids so they get to know me more better more intimately we talk about everything and i don't have any secrets in front of them but they are just some things that just don't come up in conversation eh? so i thought okay this is going to be for family and close friends and you julie are one of them so you got to read that too then amazing a few years a couple of years ago during the beginning of the corona pandemic, I thought, ah, maybe I should look at the Osho part of my autobiography again. I have time now. So maybe I can work on it a little bit more, add some more stories. And um, my mother had just died a few years previously. And when I went through all the things that she left us, I found all the letters I'd written to her in between 1979 and 1990, the years that I spent with Osho, and she had kept all the letters, so I read them again, and then remembered lots of things that I hadn't remembered previously, and altogether it became this book that you see 
behind me still here and now. <laughs> and on the cover, on the right side, on the, whoops, on the other side, on the cover, that's me receiving an energy transmission from Osho and on the back side, on this side here, it's again me, you probably recognize me there, when dancing with him in Oregon. So this book is very, very intimate and it covers the time from when I was 18 until I was 30 or so. But of course, I'm telling the stories of those days, what happened to me, what I did, how I learned, how I grew, how I failed, how I fell in and out of love and did all sorts of <laughs> funny things. <laughs> but then I added kind of reflections that I have now looking back at that time. And I, th I think it became quite a nice time document. Many of you have read Osho's books. He had an incredible impact on the, on the spiritual scene ever since he appeared in the 70s. And I think you're gonna you're gonna laugh, you're gonna cry, <laughs> and you're gonna have fun reading it. I can really vouch for that actually, because I did laugh and I did cry. Sometimes I'm phoning up saying, "Hey, <laughs> and how come I wasn't there with you?" Because it just sounded like it was just the most amazing adventure, really. Um, and it completely changed you, didn't it, from the day you got there? It changed me completely. I, you know, I started out kind of early with meditation because I, I was a great failure at school. I, I couldn't do things that I didn't like to do. I couldn't study things that I didn't feel like studying. Mm -hmm. That habit has stayed with me yes. until now, but now I can afford it at school. I couldn't. Yeah? So I was flunking exams. And not having a good time, I had a stomach ache for two years every day. It was hard for me to be in school, and all I wanted was to escape. But there was no way to escape in Germany. I had to go to school until they kicked me out. And before they kicked me out, my parents sent me to a psychologist to see if I was all right, or to see if he could help me. He was a very cool man. And he taught me uh, some kind of uh, progressive muscle relaxation, which is, I don't know if it exists in, in English and German, it's like autogenic training. Right? You go through your body part by part and then relax it, make it feel warm and relaxed and light. And I started doing that and I really got a taste of my inner self. Yeah, something that I hadn't realized really that was there. And um, a little while later, I met the father of one of my school friends who was from India. And he seemed to be different than all the people I'd met so far. So I asked him if he meditated. I didn't really know what he was. And he said, yes. I said, yeah, I noticed you are so different from all the other people I know, would you teach me that? I was 16 at the time. And he said, have you read Herman Hesse's book, Siddhartha? I said, yes, I've read it. He said, read it again. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, uh, then he said, okay, for three months, you don't have any negative thoughts. You don't talk badly about anybody. You follow a regular schedule, you don't eat meat, you don't take drugs, which is what we all did at the time. We all smoked pot. He said, you stop this. And uh, if you can do this, I'll teach you. So after three months, I went back to him. I said, I did it. Here I am. Now, where do we go from here? And he taught me meditation. That was my beginning and 
another two years later, by the time I was 18, um, we decided that I should go to India, to Pune, to Osho's ashram, to see if my brother was all right. My brother went to be with Osho in 1977, I think. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was so much bad press about him. We thought, oh my God, now he has gone completely crazy following this obscure guru. And we got to we gotta see if he's all right. So I thought, since I had two years of meditative practice, which I thought at the time was a lot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> now it's what 40 45 years there yeah, and it's still little anyway i thought it was a lot and i thought that i had some achievement of some kind i was special i was <laughs> spiritual i was great i was amazing i <laughs> totally you inflated, yeah, inflated ego so i thought <laughs> i if I go there, I'm so aloof and I'm so quiet and so in my own power, they will not be able to indoctrinate me. And if my brother is not okay, I will tell him, hey, please come home. You know, this place is really not good for you. So then I went and uh, at the time I was doing a farming apprenticeship in Germany, learning farming. I went there and I... I still remember the first step into the ashram in Pune. I just looked around and I thought, oh my God, I don't want to go any other place ever again. This mm -hmm. is what I want. And I know many people who had a very, very similar experience. That place was magic. You walked through this gate, it was called the gateless gate. And you were in a completely different world. There were people I had never seen, fire in their eyes, big hearts, smiling faces. And I thought, wow, this is what I've been looking for my whole life. And that's how I ended up staying there. I did go home afterwards quickly after realizing that my brother was doing really, really well. He was just fine. And uh, six months later, I went back again and then I stayed and your life was never the same again never the same again all the things that I learned about myself really I learned there under the guidance of Osho he didn't tell us what to do never he, he when I met him the first time he said listen you'll never believe anything that anybody tells you unless you filter it through the wisdom of your own heart and I've been doing that ever since and if that's the only advice that he had given me that would be enough yeah. <laughs> enough of a, a path a clear clear path to finding out who you are yes and of course you use it all the time I mean I've worked with you and known you for many years and of course I love that uh, and and you you bring that to almost every person who comes into your path. Um, so, but of course, this was just the start. And um, there, he also gave you your spiritual name, Ajava. Yes, at first, um, um, at first when I went in 1979, and I wanted to be his disciple, his student, he kept my old name, I was called Anand, Anand means bliss or blissful, Frank, and he said Frank means freedom. And then a few years later, I got tired of the old name, I wanted a, a discontinuation, I wanted something new, and then I asked him to change my name, and then he gave me the name Arjava, which means authentic. And this has been my my path, my challenge, my joy and my sorrow to be authentic, always to reflect and look back. Is that really me or is that 
society speaking through my mouth? Is it my condition? Is it my parents, my culture, my religion, my upbringing, my social background, or is it really me mm. speaking and acting and doing? And so I, I have my hands full with just following the meaning of my name. Which is amazing. And you do it really well. I mean, you do. I mean, I might be a bit biased, but no, you do. Um, I so think you are, you are biased. Absolutely. I am a bit biased. <laughs> but, you know, I can soon, you know, sort you out if I have to, with Bacti's help. You know, the, the good thing is that we do learn, hopefully, we do learn from our mistakes. I personally don't learn very well when things are going, going well, when they are perfect in a way, but I learn when things are not going the way that I want them to go. So it's good to make mistakes. At least it is. And you grow from the mistakes anyway. So You grow from your mistakes and you learn. Mm -hmm. So please go ahead and make them, just don't make them twice. Yeah, learn from your mistakes, yes, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we are human. <laughs> So, um, of course, I love to listen to the stories of you, your time in the ashram, and especially the ones in Pune and Pune. And I've, for those of you out there who don't know much about our show, you've probably got questions because the, the press, and even now you hear not so great things about him, and about it being um, an ashram full of sex and drugs and all those things. Was that what really happened in Pune? So everything happened in Pune, everything, everything. All the good, all the bad, and all the in-between. So from the way I understood Osho was that he gave us complete freedom to do what we wanted to do. And he encouraged everybody to do what they wanted to do and to let out what was inside so it could be healed. Mm. And for some people, the things that were inside were not very good, uh, but they too had to come out. Mm. We had to learn to deal with our anger, with our sexuality, with our uh, lust for power, with our greed, with everything. And he was like working, the ashram was like a pressure cooker, a fast forward pressure cooker where everything that was inside everything that was happening inside just came up and it was right in your face and you had to look at it and you had the chance to heal it or of course not look at it and let the chance go by so many th things were happening and the, the thing that's in the media most of the time about sex is um He, he was perhaps the only Indian master who said that you shouldn't repress your natural sexual energy, but you should live it. And if you live it consciously and lovingly and kindly, it's just fine, eh? but it becomes poisonous when you suppress it. Mm -hmm. So that was part of his teaching. And some people obviously abused that in some way, and others didn't. I was one who who didn't. Uh, it, of course, it was easy to have sexual partners because imagine there were several thousand people, many of them in their 30s and younger, and it was easy to meet people, and it was easy to meet somebody that you liked because there were so many of us and all had kind of a similar focus the focus being to find out who the hell i am yeah searching yeah. yes it was, yeah. it was easy yeah? yes and i love the stories as well what was your daily um a daily routine like in in the uh, ashram i mean what did you in, do all day in the, the 70s in pune when i went there uh, it was 1979 i uh, soon became one of the gardeners at the ashram and I started to grow Osho's food for uh, almost two years. Mm 
-hmm. So my schedule was getting up 6.30 or something, sometimes watering the garden in the morning before it got too hot. Then picking some food for him to eat, veggies. And uh, then we had uh, meditation for two hours with him every day. We worked until, I don't remember, 12, 12, 30, one o'clock, then had a lunch break and then worked again until five or six, 6 p.m. And then came another meditation. Sometimes we were sitting two, four hours every day. And it was incredible. It was the most quiet place you could possibly imagine. In the meditation hall was not allowed to cough and you were not really encouraged to move a lot, uh, but to sit quietly. Mm. And you cannot imagine how quiet it becomes when two, three thousand people are absolutely silent. It must have been amazing. Incredible. Just amazing, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, so there was structure in but it was a free structure you whether you did it or not was up to you which is wonderful and at the end of the day most people i think like structure of some sort especially when you're searching and on that spiritual path i've found that through years of working with people so that's amazing and of course you all learn things when you know when um Basically, when you're being told that everything is okay, that you are free, either you can go ahead and abuse that freedom or you become extremely responsible. Yeah. And this is what happened to me. I started to feel really responsible for myself, for what was going on in front of me but mostly for what was going on inside of me. And that really, really was an amazing teaching. Yeah. So on one hand, it looked like there was no structure, but there was a very, very strict structure underneath it. Very strict. Which is wonderful. And um, which gave, so you had that structure, but you had that freedom. That's very, very rare, I think. And how, um, outside of the ashram, how did the Indian government and the people react to our show? We're just talking about Pune at the moment. We'll move to Oregon in a while. There, it was um, it was a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the time in India, there weren't too many foreigners, mostly hippies. Mm -hmm. or, um, so when suddenly in Pune appeared this group of thousands of foreigners wearing red clothes and <laughs> acting, mm. uh, acting uh, not very Indian, yeah, yes. hugging each other on the street and kissing things that were really not done, are still not being done in India today. It was kind of a big shock. The, the people in the town, the shopkeepers and the and, uh, business people, they, they liked us. They really liked us. I remember after coming back from the US, so how many years was that later? 88, 85, six, seven years later, coming back to India, the fruit sellers on the street, they all remembered me. They were hugging me and kissing me and crying and saying, oh, how have you been? So you had that side of it and then the other side was the the media and yes. of course the Indian government at the time was um, quite conservative and they didn't like what was going on there at all they were trying to trying to make it very difficult for us mm. but on the other hand many people don't know this I had a, I think a five-year cultural visa wow yeah. Yeah. Because we we applied, the ashram workers could apply for it, uh, saying that we were meditating, learning meditation at the ashram, and that's what we got. Uh, so it was a kind of a a mixed yeah. bag. And in the West, uh, all the the media reports were saying that Osho had only 
foreign disciples. It's really not true. It's really not true. There were like thousands and thousands of of Indian disciples. Yes. Living at the ashram and living all over India. If you go to India now, there are also centers everywhere. Okay. Is the ashram in Pune his ashram still there, Shah's ash ashram? It's still there. It's of course is different because he's not there. Mm -hmm. I like everything, yeah. yes. You cannot, you cannot replicate right. that. You cannot keep that up. And he, he did not uh, install a successor because that was kind of against his, from what I understood, his um, philosophy because he said, hey, don't yeah. follow yeah. me. Yeah. That you follow yourself. You follow your own calling. We, we don't want all these little Oshos running around. We want you to be you yourself, yourself you. yeah yeah and of course he loved to push buttons too didn't he oh. <laughs> <He's>, uh... <laughs> most provocative person i ever met <laughs> and many times i was sitting there when he was talking in his public discourses and he was pushing people's buttons they're talking about politicians religious people talking about our cultural habits and then sometimes I was sitting there thinking is that really necessary is that necessary why you have to be so in everybody's face all the time but that was his way he liked to rattle the cage and yeah. he was rattling our cage day in day out shaking us up to the roots telling us that you are not your culture, you are not your religion, you are not your social conditioning. Go beyond that. Go look inside and find yourself. Mm -hmm. Look, look. It was always in the mirror was permanently in front of your face. And that was incredible, really mm -hmm. incredible. And I I wish there would be a place like that where you could go nowadays, but I'm not aware of, of anything. No. I, it was really, really mind-altering, mind-blowing and transformative. Incredible. Yeah. yeah, and of course the 60s and the 70s was like that anyway, when the world was waking up to this new age and this thinking for ourselves. So it must have been amazing. And of course I keep thinking, well, we're the same age. How come I never got there? I don't know. Obviously not meant to. I just had to meet you and you push my buttons for me instead, vice versa. But um, but I listened to your stories. And of course, the friends that you made there that you're still in touch with and the people that we meet all over who have been there. So I just think and, and how their lives changed. So then with Puna, what made him then decide to go to Oregon? Because Oregon was completely different, wasn't it? It was different in a way, but of course the underlying the underlying the red thread that was leading through it was all the same. Mm -hmm. it was all the same. It was just different subjects. I remember one of my friends he he had read somewhere in one of Osho's books there are I think about eight hundred titles in print. Yeah? Imagine that. Yeah? So uh, yeah. Um, in one of the books, he said, I will have three communes, three communities, three ashrams. The first one is going to be centered around sex, sexual energy, biological energy. The second one is about power. And the third one is about death. And that was something that he said a long, long time ago. And that's exactly what happened. So Puna was about vital energy, about learning to deal with, to contain, to transform your vital energy. Mm -hmm. The commune in Oregon was about power. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And the last one, the second um, Puna experience when Osho died was about death and how to handle that. Mm. Amazing. He was so forward thinking. And so, and of course, he picked the right place to, to deal with power in the USA. I mean, he, he so power, 
how how it happened, I don't really know. We 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 do know that he wasn't well. He had uh, big back problems. He could hardly walk in the end in Pune. In I remember in uh, April and May of 1981 when he was coming to the meditation hall. It looked so painful, and the idea was to seek medical treatment there in the U.S. And I wasn't sure if he's going. He was going to stay there, or he just went to to get treated and then he would come back. He had been trying to to, or the ashram had been trying to acquire big properties in India, but the Indian government wasn't going to have that. So in the end, they decided that they would. Uh, start a new community in the US and they picked um, <laughs> Oregon out of all places, a very conservative place to start a spiritual community. When I heard about it, I just thought, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> trouble, trouble is coming. I mean, if, if they had chosen to go to somewhere to Northern California near Mount Shasta or something, I think probably the community would still be there. Mm -hmm. but go into this conservative place. <laughs> it was asking for trouble, but he liked that. That's he right, did, yes. He, yes. He didn't want it easy. If he had said to us, hey, guys, we move into the Himalayas, into uh, some faraway place, valley all by ourselves everybody would have loved it i would have said hey i'm coming i am great he didn't want it he wanted us to to be faced with challenges all the time all the time he didn't want to start a, a monastery or something like that. i would have liked that that was one of my kind of teenage dreams to become a, a zen monk and disappear somewhere. <laughs> he didn't want it. He was very, very forward thinking. He was saying, you can't escape from yourself. It's not possible. Huh? It's possible for a while. You can go to a quiet place. And then when you come back into the world, all your underlying issues come with you again, and you haven't solved anything. So he gave us a chance to work through stuff in fast forward yes and it worked in many cases in many cases it worked not in all yeah? i know many many people who who greatly benefited from that experience and i know people who got hurt and who turned against him everything yeah? everything was there mm. but it's, it was part of his plan or whatever his idea was so he absolutely Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What, what of the, one of the things he, he often said was that the door is open for you to come in, but the door is also open for you to go out and leave. Well, great, because that, you know, I mean, isn't that the way to look at things that, you know, and he's teaching, yeah, teaching that we're all different. Um, and, and I like the fact that he stirred things up. I think that's wonderful. And of course, I love it when you stir things up, when you're using his teachings and you get, you get people thinking. So I love that and that you learn from that. Um, I just I just keep thinking, why wasn't I there? <laughs> I love it. Maybe we should make a dojo. We, we should do an ashram in, in uh, Lesbos. Maybe. Maybe that's what we should do. Uh, <laughs> you cannot replicate. No. Uh, you need to somebody like that otherwise spiritual communities uh, it's difficult it's it, very yeah. difficult because we all are driven by different yeah. motives yes. or yes. small yeah. or and egos and it's yeah. very difficult not to do it you need somebody who has a, a different type of vision yes yeah, and those people Kind of, kind of rare, yeah? very yeah, rare. Yes, yes, very rare. But he was needed. Um, I know this is probably a, a difficult question, but what do you think he would think of the world right now and all the stuff that's going on? I mean, what do you think he'd be saying? I mean, it's hypothetical, I know, but 
he would say just use this use this challenging these challenging days to go inside and to look at yourself mm. and find out who you are that's the only thing just mm. look inside the more difficult the times are the easier it is you you know many people have spiritual experiences when they've got the water up to here yes when it's rough, when it's hard, when you're physically ill, when you've lost somebody, when you yourself are dying, when you have accidents, illness, bankruptcy, all those kind of situations are the best for growth. And I think the the corona um, drama has been really a blessing in mm-hmm. Mm. in disguise yeah? because you could really really look inside and re-evaluate your life yourself look at what you really want to do mm. stop the nonsense mm. yeah, it's a great it's a great chance for for waking up that's yeah. what he would say yeah and i think it has been as well so the corona the coronavirus because we're all just coming through it now but now I am seeing, and you're probably seeing how people have changed and how everybody's now trying to adapt to these new ways and are having to look inside themselves. And it is challenging. Um, It's not easy. So uh, you were just so lucky you were there. Um, So then he moved back from Oregon and he went back to Pune and this was where he died. So... In Oregon, the place was incredible. It was really totally incredible. It was about the size of Tokyo. Wow. Unimaginable. I was working again in the farming department, driving very big farming equipment. We had fields outside of the city limits. And I remember one of the fields was about 30 kilometers away from my house on the property. Wow. It was huge, huge. huge. And it when we got there was an overgrazed, huge, overgrazed cattle ranch, and when we left, a big part of it was lush green. And wow. I mean, what we did there was just spectacular, incredible. I was very lucky because I worked i had work that i loved to do the people i worked with were my best friends we still we still are friends those who are alive and um, i didn't suffer there at all but many people did suffer because um, maybe many of you have seen the uh, netflix series wild wild country this was really not um, a documentary about Osho was more about Sheila, his secretary, oh. then who really messed things up. Yes. Big time. yes. But also, we must say that she was instrumental in creating another incredible learning experience for all of us and oh. other people who involved. For example, I learned in four, three years that I spent there. I learned to never give my power away. Yeah. Never to let somebody step on me mm. ever again. Mm. Uh, mm. And to always reflect back to what's going on inside. Mm. And for me, that was an incredible experience. Wow. Yeah. yeah um, but some didn't have a good time there because. Sheila was really crazy, if you if you ask me. Yeah, but maybe she was part of his plan. For mm-hmm. sure, for sure. Yeah. You know, she to. knew, yeah. yeah. He, was not, he, knew, he knew what he was doing. And yeah, he exactly, knew. exactly. And again, it's pushing buttons. Yeah, he, he knew which jobs to give to which people. Yeah. yeah. So if, yes. if you want to run a, a huge corporation which that was you need certain people to do it if he had asked me to do it it would have never happened <laughs> <No>. <laughs> how is it financed where did the finance come from it was, it was financed by um, 
a lot of it by donations. There were many wealthy people who gave money. They weren't pressured into mm -hmm. giving it, but they gave it freely. I know many people who did. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had communities all over Europe, mm -hmm. most in Japan also. And um, in Germany, for example, we had discotheques. And these discotheques, they were called the Zorba, the Buddha discotheques. Oh, wow. they in place where everybody went to dance. And um, the people loved them because women, and there were many single women going there to dance because they said, this is the only place that's not a meat market where I can just dance. I don't have to bother people. Don't try to pick me up here. It's not a pickup joint. You can just go and enjoy yourself and go home and it's all safe and there's no drugs and no no sexual harassment and anything like that, which is so funny, yeah? Because on one hand, we were supposedly the sex gurus. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And on the other people were coming to our discourse because there was no harassment. sexual sexual harassment going on. I mean, quite incredible, really. Very incredible. I mean, really, really and, incredible in places to go they were full every day they were I'm huge sure. i'm sure i'm sure millions and millions and millions of euros and that money went to finance the ranch wow he was so clever and everybody yeah. enjoyed themselves and it was so so some people say it was a cult i personally don't think it was in the cult sense and you would say the same i think Absolutely not. I mean, he basically, he always said, don't follow me, mm. follow your heart, be yourself. I don't want you to, mm. to be like me or to, he did, as I said uh, in the beginning of this conversation, he, he never told you what to do. He right? always said, hey, what do you want to do? Go inside, take a look, and then you do what you have energy for. Just wonderful, really wonderful. <laughs> And look, because I have read the book, so I know so many of the stories. And I really I hope that the people listening here are going to um, pay and buy this beautiful book from you because it's really, really worth it. And you'll get lots of answers, if there are any answers, but you'll you'll see the fun and um, the genuine love and, and the, gen yeah, the authenticism of the whole thing and you. Um, so I just, every day when you talk about this, I should have been there, <laughs> I should have been there, but I was not meant to be there. So anyway, so after Oregon, he then went back to Pune. Oh, oh no, before we go back to Pune, the US government didn't like him, did they? No, oh, of course not. He, <laughs> he, was not he was not helping that either. <laughs> he always liked to provoke people. That was his his method mm. and of course in the end it ended it was clear it was clear to me from the very beginning when I went there I loved the place I loved this kind of semi-desert places they have this sweetness that really gets me I, I live in a place like this now mm -hmm. physically very similar Mm. And when I went there, immediately I looked around, I loved the place, I loved the people, I loved everything, but I knew this is not going to last, this is, it can't last, yeah? this is not meant to last, mm -hmm. this is an experiment to provoke something in individuals, and um, when that provocation has happened, the place will close down. Mm. Mm -hmm. So when, when earlier you were saying I, people think oh, Osh, the Osho movement was a cult, a cult is always about a group of, of sheep following some leader. The, the, the people who were with Osho, the sannyasins, his disciples, it was a group of individuals, very different. They didn't have this sheep mentality. <laughs> Okay, some people did. Well, you'll always get them. I mean, that's life. And this is the this is the thing. If you think um, 
a spiritual community is a, is a community of enlightened or better people than in society. You're very wrong. It's just society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Miniature society, and in that society, you find everything. You find good people, bad people, nice people, clever people, everything. Like you do in the world, and the one of Osho's specialties was, as I said earlier, to bring out or to encourage people to bring out what was inside. So you found everything there, everything. If when you found everything you were looking for too, if you were looking for girlfriends or boyfriends, you could find. If you were looking for money, you could find it. If you're looking for anything, you would find it and you would find it quickly. Mm -hmm. Quite incredible. Yeah? Like a, a, a accelerated society, yeah? but really accelerated. You could, in a few years, you could just really make headway there. Mm -hmm. And so forward thinking in many ways, just so out there. Just amazing. Maybe we could do with somebody like that again now. Maybe maybe somebody will pop along. You never know. I'm sure. I'm sure. Soon, I think the world's ready now. So after the after Oregon, then he went back to Pune, and then he talked about and then this was about death. Yes. Yeah, so after after the ranch, um, I went back to Germany with uh, with my American girlfriend. We stayed in Germany for a while, and then we heard that he had gone to Nepal. Mm. So we went, and we saw him there. It was very nice. And then afterwards, he went to Crete, and he went to 20 other countries. Most of the countries didn't allow him even entry. It was incredible, like an odyssey of unbelievable proportions. <laughs> They didn't want him anywhere. And then in the end, he, he went back to India where they couldn't refuse him because he was Indian. Indian national. So he went back to Pune and um, I also went back there and then spent the remaining time with him until he died. And after he died, I went to Japan and then started a whole new, a whole new chapter yeah. of life. Reiki, but yeah. if I hadn't had the previous training, I wouldn't be able to do what I do, and I wouldn't be able to live. Uh, so for me, it was, I mean, putting it kind of harshly was either being with him or suicide. I wasn't considering suicide, but that was the, the atmosphere. Yeah? He was the, the chance for many of us that we've been waiting for. And, and you've I, got the opportunity and you tuck it and that's the most wonderful thing. And even your brother did well whilst he was there, but not so well once Osho had left. Yeah. Yeah, this, this was hard for many people. I think his death was very hard for for many of us. For me, it, it wasn't. Yeah? I, I never thought that... Um, he died. Hmm. It's like like parents, yeah? parents, spiritual teachers. They don't die. Where where can they go? Exactly. They are inside here. When you think of them, when you remember, they're always with you. Yeah? So they can't really leave. But many people felt left alone after he died because he had, uh, even though it looked like it was loose. He had a very strong hand eh? and he was disciplining the people who were there who needed that. Eh? There was a wild bunch of people. They really needed discipline eh? and they got it from him. Mm -hmm. When he left, some of them fell through the cracks. Couldn't handle it. Which him. happens anyway. So he really, he was a really very forward thinker. He was a great leader. He encouraged and he grew all of you and you all had the opportunity and it was then your choice whether you grew or whether you fell apart. Yeah, I. Uh, this is a good question. I don't know how much choice 
we actually do have. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. it's just, I'm not sure how much of it is, is up to us uh, because that implies that you have a free will. I'm not so sure about that really. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I know, for example, I had a carefree childhood and there are many issues that people that I met later on in life had, I never had. But it's not that I'm better or that I passed through lots of things. I just didn't have that from the beginning. Yeah? So it's not my achievement, not at all. Yeah? Mm -hmm. it's kind of. Well, we're all here for a different reason and we're all here to learn and to experience and to take the most of what is offered to us and you took the chance and you made the most of it and it's and it's um uh, multitude for the rest of your life really and of course you had your first experience of reiki in Pune the first time round and you didn't even think anything of it oh. <laughs> and now look at you yeah, I didn't. If you want to share that story, you're very welcome to share. Yeah, it was. This was in in 1988. So in the after we came back from Oregon in 1987, Osho was in Bombay and then moved again to Pune. And I came in '88. A few months later, mm -hmm. after after he went back to Pune, and one day I remember I had a terrible headache. And the uh, a friend of my former wife was doing Reiki and she, uh, she gave me a Reiki treatment trying to help me with the headache. It didn't work. I found it absolutely boring and silly. She didn't touch me. She was working in my auric field somewhere. And I just thought, oh, what a new age nonsense this is. Yeah? And then afterwards, I went to a local pharmacy, got some painkillers. <laughs> then thought, oh, Reiki is a bunch of... Whatever. Whatever, yeah, something that I wasn't interested in. And then I caught myself in, in the next weeks after that, looking for somebody to teach me. <laughs> I didn't understand myself, thinking, why you want to learn this crazy thing? You know, it didn't work. It, it was all kind of new agey hocus pocus. Why you want to why you want to learn this? I couldn't understand it. But finally I did understand it years later that somehow that treatment it touched something deep inside. Yes. Tickled my soul. And once that soul is tickled, it cannot forget. They can't. And, and and really, it's so wonderful. And thank God that you were there when it happened and you'd had all that teaching and you've been able to just bring the, this beautiful Reiki to the world and you have the strength to do it and the understanding and the in-depth learning that really you need to, to, to do what you have done and you have achieved. So it's all thanks yeah, to I, going to, to... If I didn't have that previous yeah. experience, so I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. No, no. I wonder what would have happened to you. People often ask me, oh, how is it to be famous or the, all these books? And I'm like, are you kidding me? It doesn't, doesn't touch me at all. No. It doesn't do, doesn't do anything to me. No, it doesn't. I can, this, it doesn't. this is all due to the what I learned from, from him. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So um, before we close, what would you like to say to other people who are now only just discovering our show or follow our show? Or uh, what, what would you like to advise you to give to anybody now that you learned or you took from that experience? It's, it's kind of simple. It's... Um, Going back to the beginning of our conversation when I said that after my two years of meditation, I thought that <laughs> was some achievement that I had. Um, my advice is go out, find a meditation technique that you like, mm. 
do it every day. Yeah. Yeah. Until you die. Until you die, yeah. And really, the more we learn, the less we know, really. I mean, that's my philosophy because everything, there's so much out there. And we have to, and, and it keeps our egos at bay as long as we keep putting that ego on our left shoulder and saying, just stay there, let me just learn, let me really ask, let me go back into my heart, like you said, and go back into my heart and ask, is this right? And don't judge. To me, to me, that's a ticket. Eh? And the, the best way I can think of to get there is some kind of meditative practice, mm -hmm. which you don't do to get somewhere or to get something to reach this proverbial carrot that you have placed in front of your own nose and which by definition you can never reach but you do the meditation for its own sake you just sit and you sit and you sit and you sit and you sit some more and you sit some more and you start watching your your thoughts and you start to get some kind of inkling of who you are and you need to keep because, doing. yeah you bring this practice into when you're teaching anyway whenever whatever we do we do something from that um and i was just thinking that maybe uh we can't do it today but maybe we could do another uh, video uh, uh zoom session like this for the channel where you could talk about some of those meditations the osho meditations and maybe share some of them if you wish we could do this at a later state because i know how much it helps. Um, so if you'd like to do that. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah, I think so. Um, because it really helps and um, and it's so much part of you. So but the, the point really is for me that um, you'll find a technique that you like. It doesn't have to be Osho meditation. Maybe you like Vipassana inside meditation or zazen or whatever it is whatever it is just find something that you like and do it every day for a few years at least two at least two <laughs> for many years yeah that's the ticket that worked for me it might not work for everybody yeah, yeah. But it's a good start. It's a good start. And when you notice that you're becoming more kind, more loving, more more compassionate uh, and more aware, uh, then you you know you're on the right track and just keep going, keep doing it. Yeah. Keep it and, 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 and making your heart smile. You need to learn to discipline your mind. That's the most important thing. Uh -huh. And that is the hardest thing as well at times. So, and of course, you're always saying we need to put a smile in our hearts. Yes, and this happens um, kind of inevitably when you're becoming more aware, the heart starts to open up. Right? Yeah. And then the awareness is mixed with sweetness, with tenderness, and then you're in space. Yeah. Well, it's just been wonderful talking to you as usual. Um, of course, this book has only just been published. They can purchase it where? On Amazon, bookstores, any online stores. Um, you've not seen your own hard copy yet, have you? Have you received it yet? No? No. <laughs> no, but you'll get to see it soon. Uh, it's been very yeah. well received. Hmm. Um, we, live, we live on a, an island in Greece, and this was an island. And um, because of the logistic difficulties these days, it's difficult to get some things here. So I have to order the books in, in Germany or somewhere else in Europe or in the US and then have them shipped to me. Yeah, well, it'll arrive in time when you're meant to get it. But it's a beautiful book. So if anybody would like to contact Java himself, you can, come through me on here or you can message him um, at frankajavapetter at gmail.com is that right look on his website so that's www.frankajavapetter you'll find him he's all over you just need to type him in and he pops up on google or whatever um, and 
I really, because I've read this, I I think if you want to know more about our show, follow him, or just would love to read the story of uh, Java, it's highly recommended. Um, is there anything you'd like to say before we close? <laughs> no, I love the way you do that. So if you like what you've heard, please, uh, you know, do, do uh, subscribe to the channel and uh, or, or just add a like and we will bring much more of a Java to the channel. He, we've already done several things on the other books he's written. He's written many other books. You had a, your poetry books came out recently too. Do you want to push them? Do you want to say something? Yes, yes. Let's see. I actually brought copies. Oh. So the, the Corona times have been very rewarding for me in the sense that I've had lots of time to to do writing and to go through things that I've already written previously and put them together. So the first one I did was, oh, I have to change my background to be able to show you. We'll do that, we get rid of the, the book cover. Ah, the technology is amazing. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> you can... See, huh? did that work? No. Ah, okay. Now I am done. Yes, there you are. Oh, here I am. Hello again. <laughs> this is, oops. One with Reiki. One with Reiki. This was written in the beginning of the Corona, Corona drama. Mm -hmm. Very nice book. You love Very it nice. if you like it. Then I published a book about kind of my inner experience in the last uh, 45 years of meditation and it's called Is. It's again amazing. So you don't have to follow Reiki or no Reiki to read that one. It's got amazing um, exercises and things in for you to do. Highly recommended. And then the next one I did was an old dream of mine to publish poetry. So yeah. this Love Speaks. Called Love Speaks, all about different aspects of love. Mm -hmm. Very Enjoy. nice. Very nice. And then the recent one is called Promise Me Never to Get Hurt. And this one is all about pain. So the first one's about love. The second one is about pain. And there are three others that are kind of ready. So stay tuned for more. Yes, and we'll we'll definitely bring the information here onto the channel as well. So I know what's coming. So I know there's some amazing things coming. And of course, if you like Reiki or follow Reiki, you've got all his many other books. Um, so you just need to type his name in to Google and you will find everything or into Amazon. But um, the Osho book is just, if you like Osho and you want to understand more, highly recommended so i'd love to say thank you again to you and um i really look forward to bringing you back soon and he does love to hear from you and i love to hear from you so please do uh, contact us if um if you want to and we're always in touch with each other so i'll always pass any messages to him anyway so once again thank you and uh if you do like what you hear please do press like on the channel and uh, let's talk a Java again soon. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Bye.